Hi there, my name is Bob Plankers. I'm with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm gonna talk about uh, how I stopped worrying and learned to love complexity. About six years ago, there was a guy, Donald Norman. Uh, he's a designer, a vice president, ex-vice president of Apple Computer Corporation. And he wrote a book, Living with Complexity. And I read this book. This book actually had some fundamental uh, fundamental truths in it for me. I'm an ar IT architect, I design systems. And one of the things that he said in his book is that complexity, we, we really can't avoid complexity. And simplicity, you know, we always say that we want things to be simple, but we, as it turns out, we really don't. Simplicity leads to other problems. We're, we're actually looking for something else. And as an example, example from my own house, I present to you the Apple TV remote. Apple TV remote is simple. Uh, actually, this is the Apple TV Generation 4 remote. It's less simple than the previous, but it's only got a few buttons. The buttons on it do multiple things. You push, you push the button once, and uh, because there aren't very many buttons, you, they have to overload the functions of these buttons. So you push the button once, you push the menu button once, and it does one thing. You push it twice, and it does a, a different thing. You hold it down, and it does a third thing. That pad on the top of the remote, you can swipe on it. It turns out it's a button too. It doesn't look like a button. You can even talk to the remote. I don't know why I'd want to talk to my remote. You know, it's probably one of the most useless conversations I'll have all day. But, uh, um, but the remote is simple, you know. And I'm not picking on Apple here. It's just uh, an example of something that uh, uh, causes, causes problems in my, in my daily life. So instead, we've got a Logitech Harmony remote. It seems to have all the buttons, and probably has too many buttons, but each button it is well-defined. Each button, It's got a little screen to tell you what mode it's in, what it's controlling. You know what? It leads to less confusion overall, and that's good, you know? Uh, as much as I love explaining to my wife how to, how to stream her workout video from our Plex server, you know, like, I'd love it if she could just do it herself. You know, and with, with a little bit more complexity, she can. So that, that's really Don Norman's point, is that we're not, we're not after simplicity, we're actually after less confusion. We don't want to feel dumb. We don't want to feel confused in our life. And you know, that, that really <clears throat> resonates with me as a guy that designs, builds, and, and uh, maintains IT infrastructures. You know, we, my team works in the dead of the night sometimes, we get called, we're sleepy. Anytime I can reduce confusion, that sounds like a good thing. So yeah, minimizing confusion. How, how does my team do that? Well, for starters, we, we look at everything as a standardization problem. You know, if we're gonna do something more than once, we standardize that uh, uh, thing. We write, a pro we write a process, or if we can avoid it, if we can use a tool like Puppet, do some configuration management, do an automated deployment. Uh, we use, uh, we're a Dell EMC world today, and uh, uh, to use an example from, from their world, the, uh, um, the IDRAC controllers on the uh, PowerEdge servers have the ability to push, uh, to import and export a, uh, XML files. We use that extensively to, to set configurations up, make sure that monitoring and alerting is standard across all of our equipment, that sort of thing. The same is true of infrastructure pieces. You know, I do a lot of virtualization, I'm trying to figure out what where vCenter is, what it might be named. Naming is a huge, a huge area where we've standardized, you know, uh, where we have uh, decided, you know, instead of, instead of pets, you know, instead, we used to name things with uh, unique names, mythical creatures. We actually have a naming scheme, mythical creatures that suck, you know, like you can tell what we, what we think about that project. But uh, um, tree names, flowers, things like that. So what of, what of those, you know, the server Maple, is that a vCenter server? What, is, what does it do? Is it the SMTP relay for the environment? Hard to tell. So uh, we got rid of that stuff, you know. Uh, the, the infrastructure pieces are now named after the project. They've got the function in it, you know, like if it, perhaps it's a networking project, so it's net-vCenter-A1. That vCenter lives at, at site A, and it's the first vCenter. You know, 
we know exactly where it is. We also use uh, DRS rules to pin it to a very particular a very particular hypervisor in the environment. That way we always know where it is. If we have if we have an outage and we have to go looking for the uh, the vCenter, we know where it's going to be. You know, it's not a search and rescue operation for our infrastructure. You know, likewise, you know, we're treating our our servers, we've got a whole lot of Dell servers. We treat them as cattle now. You know, there's pros and cons to different naming schemes for the uh, um, for servers, but when it comes right down to it, what we decided was just to name the servers after their serial numbers. You know, sure, we might be leaking a little information, and somebody could call in a warranty request if they learn our, our serial numbers. But generally, anybody that's seeing that, seeing those those names, we can trust anyhow. What it's done, though, we don't have to translate between. Uh, we don't have to go to our CMDB and tr use that to translate between a machine name, Maple, and its serial number to call in a, a parts request. You know, I can call in a parts request without even being attached to my corporate network. And that's actually pretty cool. Actually, it's not pretty cool. I'd rather, you know, not do that at all, but hardware is hardware and sometimes hardware fails. So just adopting a mindset that things are cattle, doing some standardization of your naming schemes, using DNS to its full extent. Uh, I see a lot of people that, that don't use DNS domains at all. You know, they overload. You, in my example where it was like net-vcenter-a1, I'm overloading the host name with more information. But you can also use, use that. I, I could turn around and I could, I could actually do vcenter-a1.net.domain.com or something like that. You know, and that's another, that's another very legitimate option. So, the uh, uh, standardizing using tools like configuration management, Puppet, we love Puppet. The uh, um, doesn't really matter what you use. If you like Ansible, use Ansible. Uh, I like Puppet because it, they're getting into the Windows space, and uh, we can do more more configuration stuff there. You know, some of the other tools are very Unix centric. And that's neat if you live in an all Unix environment, but I don't. You know, I need Active Directories. I need, I always have a few Windows boxes. I've got a WSS server. I've got an antivirus server where, you know, that's a Windows application as well. And uh, so being able to be cross platform like that, using things like M Collective to, to issue commands, ad hoc commands, and, and uh, uh, items like that, that's, that's pretty handy. And. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that we really try to do, and I alluded to it before, anytime, they, uh, uh, anytime we have to do something more than once, we try to write a procedure around it. And I'd rather write a puppet manifest, I'd rather write, write it as an a actionable piece of, of configuration code. One, it, it's sort of self-documenting. You do have to leave comments there. I do urge people to use uh, good programming practices when they do things like that. Standardization of code is important as well. But... Uh, um, when you do that, all of my environments, all the discrete environments that I support and my team supports, when we make an update to, let's say, the SMTP relay in, in one environment, we make some improvements to it or something like that, all of the other environments can benefit, and they will benefit automatically, you know, and that's pretty cool. So heavy standardization, can't urge that enough. But at the same time, you know, uh, we will run into, we do run into in instances where people ask us to violate our standards, you know? And you have to decide, do you want to say no? Saying no is, we don't, it's my opinion that we don't say no enough in our industry, you know? But it should be a no but, you know? Or perhaps a yes but. Yes, we could do that. But like my slide says, be flexible. You know, some customers actually have needs and this is where the complexity comes in. We can't escape complexity. Some customers have different replication needs than others, you know, and trying to force them all into to one scenario might not be feasible. They might not have the budget for it. They might not have the bandwidth for it, you know. Uh, in a case that we're dealing with right now where, you know, my team doesn't like situations where in virtual environments where there's no DRS, there's no vMotion, there's no HA especially. You know, but for some of our customers, having a, a single standalone hypervisor, single standalone ESXi box somewhere out in the field is really is actually really important. That's a, that's a, a key piece. So being able to support that is something that we've got to do. 
So we're looking at how do we how do we extend our standard? How do we flex our standards a little bit so that we don't create additional confusion? Can can we achieve what they would like without without adding confusion on our part, without uh, having to, to have more processes, more procedures? I like having one procedure for a, a particular operation, you know. And if we can do that, I think that would be great, you know. Being flexible, though, you know, there's only, you know, I, I liken it, you can only say no to a customer so many times, you know. So saying, yeah, saying yes to them and finding a way to meet in the middle, that's really important. So in conclusion, I thank you for taking time to listen to me. You know, uh, simplicity, it's not about simplicity. It's about confusion. We want to reduce confusion. We don't want to reduce complexity. Complexity, limit, uh, complexity gives us choices. Confusion drags us down. Uh, we want to standard, standardize our cattle. If we've got a whole bunch of something, we want them all to look the same. We want to know at four in the morning when we're logging into something to, to look at what's wrong that certain pieces are going to be there. Assumptions are great. You know, assumptions, humans love to make assumptions. So let's help, let's help us humans make assumptions. And then, like I was saying, you know, instead of no but, press yes but, you know, we'd love to incorporate your ideas, we'd love to meet your needs, let's do it, if it's cool with you, Mr. Customer, why don't we change the way we do it a little bit, you know, why don't we meet in the middle, we, uh, yeah, you know, that sort of thing. That's, you know, that, that's a soft skill, that's touchy, but with a little bit of practice, with, with a little bit of practice, you can get used to saying no and having people love you still. Thank you very much. I'm Bob Plankers.